Good morning, Identiverse. Um, I'm glad you could join me this morning, especially those of you who are at boot camp or yoga. Um, I assiduously avoided joining those activities like I usually do, so I'm happy to continue that proud tradition <laughs> for myself. Uh, I'm Nishant Kaushik. I run R&D for Unican. We build and enable and secure end-to-end -end, uh, journeys for high assurance customer identities uh, with a focus on um, usability and in ensuring that security and uh, usability don't have to be compromised between uh, by using identity itself. Uh, before I start, two caveats. Number one, uh, no identity were harmed in the making of these slides. There's no Photoshops this year. I'll say that out loud first. Um, secondly, my topic is not about IoT. Uh, it's actually an homage to Don Norman's brilliant book about the principles that we need to follow in designing objects and systems, both physical and digital, that people use on an everyday basis, like doors. Uh, identity is obviously something that the majority of the planet at this point uses on an everyday basis. So a lot of those principles really apply to the work we do, and it's been heavily influential on what I've been doing at Unican. Uh, but um, what I really want to focus on is specifically how that applies in the nature of trust and what we as identity practitioners need to be doing. And I want to start with a story. Um, a, a short time ago, a VC, which for the purposes of this talk, and this talk only means venture capitalists and not verifiable credentials, um, announced that they were uh, raise, uh, raising a fund from individual investors to support an early stage company. And um, knowing what this uh, VC supports, I was intrigued. So I went to the website, uh, learned a little bit about it, and clicked on the I want to invest button. It made me open an account, and it sent me to this page where my eye was immediately drawn to that blue verify my identity button with some explainer text. Uh, when I clicked on that, it opened a modal dialog with more explainer text, uh, a link to a privacy statement. And underneath the dialog, which some of you may not be able to see, in very subtle gray, a link to the service provider that they used. Now, um, I clicked on the privacy policy and fell asleep halfway through reading it. I went to the service provider's uh, website. Uh, because at Unican, I am heavily involved in building identity verification problems. I'm actually familiar with this Venn, uh, particular uh, provider. But most ordinary human beings are not going to know anything about them. Most of you, I guess, are not going to know anything about them. Uh, when you do that. Anyway, I proceeded. It asked me for my mobile number and my legal name. Uh, I got an OTP, which I quickly verified. Then it asked for my address, which I'm not so bothered by, and my date of birth, which I usually provide a fake date of birth to most services I'm signing up for. But in this case, I had a feeling it wouldn't work if I provided a fake one. And then it asked for my social security number. So everybody's been throwing their dog's pictures in. This is not my dog. I don't have a dog. But quick show of pause, how many of you would have stopped at that page when it asked you to provide your social security number? How many of you have stopped earlier in the process? I agonized over this because I know the VC and the work that they do. I'm familiar with, the invest I'm familiar with how investor rules work and KYC requirements in this space. There was nothing in the flow that I saw that indicated to me that it was a scam or any kind of phishing exercise. And it seemed to have all the right signals. There was clear explanation text. There was links to privacy statements, repeated statements that my data would be secure, encrypted, and not used for any other purpose. And I still didn't proceed. But they got the money they needed, right? They actually got oversubscribed, I think, to the tune of 4x of what their initial goal was. So I'm very happy for that. But clearly, they would have lost, they lost out of my money, and they would have lost out a lot of the, uh, your people's money. So what explains this difference? What explains that some people were comfortable and other people were not? In a word, trust. Different people arrived at completely different levels of trust despite interacting with the exact same screens, process, and information. And before we chalk this up to the deep seated paranoia for curmudgeonly security practitioners um, uh, who knows that everything is broken, I will point out that there are a number of security and privacy professionals who I know who invested in this. And that's because trust is a tricky thing. 
According to Rachel Botsman, trust is having a confident relationship to the unknown. Or to put it more viscerally, a sense of whether somebody's going to screw you over. This abstract nature of trust creates a real challenge for us in tech. Because as Don Norman points out in his book, tech is precise, accurate. It follows rules and commands, no matter how insensible or illogical. While people are imaginative, creative, and intuitive, they fill in gaps in information and apply common sense. Well, most people. But bridging this disconnect requires us to understand that trust is manufactured. And since all manufactured things are designed, that means we have to design for trust. So how do we do that? And how does identity play into this? The key to designing trustworthy systems is following the principles of human-centered design. Human-centered design is the process of ensuring that people's needs are met. And trust is a fundamental human need, like coffee. Coffee and trust are fundamental human needs, the fundamental human needs. So in the digital realm that we all work with and that we're all concerned with, trust is a person's experience of your product or service that leads them to believe the following critical things. That it can solve their current need. That it'll be as simple and easy to use as possible. That they will not inadvertently do something that they did not intend. That they will not be deliberately tricked into doing something that they did not intend that they will understand everything that happens through the journey and any outcomes thereof, and that they will clearly consent to any data, financial, or material transaction that occurs. And maybe that they will experience some level of positive overall impression of your brand or uh, product, creating a desire to return. Now, convincing someone of all of these things is not an easy task. You have to put scaffolding in place to support the individual in their determination of whether to trust you or not. And there are many parts to the scaffolding that there are a lot of experts in the UX community and UX research that I have really heavily leaned on and used in this deck uh, that, I'm, that I've derived from and that I've derived from in my daily work. But I want to talk about a few specific things that are intricately tied to the work that we all do in identity. And I'll start with a simple one. Visual design used to be something that we were not very good at in identity. But I'm happy to say that over my last 20 plus years in identity, I've seen a lot of improvements being made in the space. But what we don't talk about enough is the role that visual design plays in building trust with the end user. Basically, aesthetics matter because they reflect the care and attention that you have put into the product. And that is a contributor to the trust that a person derives from that information, that experience that they have. Now, understanding this aspect actually flips something that we talk about and that Eve actually touched on, which is this idea of delighting the user. We hear about this a lot. I've personally talked about it and been guilty of promoting this idea that we need to delight the user. But this can actually backfire on us in the area of trust. Because what we should be focusing on is usability and using recognized design patterns. It's important to remember that learned behavior for common interaction patterns across different websites, such as those that we deliver in identity, get ingrained really quickly in people's minds. People employ shortcuts and create mental models that they then apply across. And the objective in most identity interactions is to be as unobtrusive and mindless as possible, because usually our role is the, to be the facilitator, not the actual objective. Not, we're not actually what the user is there to do. So while we can come up with cool new ways of doing something that we feel is differentiating and gives us a unique uh, place in the market or you know, promotes our brand, it fails the objective of allowing the user to engage in familiar experiences with no instruction. And when you force a new behavior pattern that is unexpected on them, you make them feel wary of what is going on. They no longer feel safe and confident and in control of their own experience. And this is a very real problem that we've seen in logins. If you ever get past pa uh, passwords, if we ever get past passwords, this is a real problem that we have right now with all the passwordless tech that we're delivering. It's a real holdback, from my personal experience, in being able to roll out things like WebR10, where the experience is not something that I, as an identity provider, actually sometimes control. And it's a real challenge. A corollary to this is not to use dark patterns. 
Eve touched on this a little bit. Dark patterns are design patterns that are deliberately trying to trick people into doing something that they wouldn't consciously do. And in many cases, they actually abuse the learned knowledge of standardized design patterns that people have, thereby weaponizing their trust. Phishing simulations in corporate environments are a dark pattern. I encourage everybody to look at the work of Dr. Jessica Barker and a number of other people in security research who look at the human side of security. Their research shows just how much phishing tests create distrust in your employees, which will backfire on you when you try to roll out new identity tech or new processes or new security uh, in innovations. In the consumer space, we're seeing dark patterns infiltrate what we do in identity, like this example that hijacks the familiar Remember Me checkbox. Dark patterns often try to invert the meanings of checkboxes from opt-in to opt-out, or try to sneak in a permission or consent under the covers of some other requirement like security. And the emergence of these dark patterns in areas of identity is directly tied to another key element of trustworthy design, which is the proper use of data. Since the objective of many dark patterns is the collection of data that the person wouldn't want to give us otherwise. The design of trustworthy systems hinges on appropriate data practices, how we ask for it, for what purpose, how we communicate this usage and explain it, and the level of transparency and control that we give people over it. Any sense that someone gets that something is a little off in this regard will erode their trust in your product. Nowhere did we see this at play in the identity context than when Facebook asked users to provide their mobile numbers for 2FA, and then it was revealed that they were using it as part of their ad targeting. The FTC imposed a $5 billion fine on Facebook for this and other privacy violations. And you would think that this would send a message to other providers to not do this. And then we found out that Twitter had been doing the same thing. It's stuff like this that gives me trust issues. I feel your fury. <sighs> Had to get my MCU thing in. In identity, we collect, handle, and generate a lot of really sensitive data. And it is our responsibility to make sure that this data isn't misused. Adopting pri uh, privacy by design principles like data minimization, data classification, encryption, access controls, and even data expiration are crucial. But I would argue that it actually goes beyond that. As vendors and service providers, it is imperative that we take responsibility for how that data is used. We cannot hide behind the fact that we are just tech and we're just providing APIs, and we don't know and we can't control how our customers use that data. If we have APIs, we have to make decisions about whether we expose certain data in our APIs. We can't just say we have the data, we have to make it part of an API. Or if we are going to make it available as part of an API, we need to know how our customers are going to use that. Maybe even go beyond a step beyond that. We're all familiar with how, as customers, customers will often ask vendors and service providers to sign a contract saying that they will not use the data that the customer provides that service provider beyond its intended use and not share it with anybody else. Why don't we have the reverse of that? Why don't we as vendors and service providers have contractual commitments from customers saying that they will not use the data beyond what we intend for them, that data to be used, and it will not be abused? I think it's time that we have stuff like that in place. We can't talk about the use of data, and more importantly, the user's perception of that use without talking about another element of trustworthy design, which is establishing an appropriate value exchange. Basically, whenever you ask somebody to take any action or share any data, your system has to be able to satisfactorily answer the question, why? Even more tricky, you have to set things up so that when that, that, when that question arises in the uh, person's mind, the answer is immediately obvious to them, because any hesitancy any need for them to go and figure out the answer or read the documentation is going to build distrust. There are well-known strategies that we are familiar with, like progressive profiling, that can be married to process improvements that we can enable to make this happen. But in most organizations, and even in most products, we're not prepared for this. 
Because setting up a proper value exchange requires really hard work, mapping actions, data, permissions, and credentials to those points in the user's lifecycle and journey where they make the most sense, and therefore are able to be contextually fit in and explained. A simple example for it would be not forcing or requiring a person to set up their account recovery credentials until their account has reached some sort of value to them. And at that point, you issue the behavioral nudge. Going back to uh, what Ian talked about with regards to incentives. Incentive models are powerful. Behavioral nudges are powerful. But they have to be done at the right time to make sense. And we have a tendency to just try to front load everything into the sign-up process or front load everything into a pr or, or side load everything into a big, massive settings uh, screen that the user never goes to. The need for clear, transparent, and honest communication is a pretty obvious one. I'm, I'm sure everybody here would agree. But it's one that we have a hard time codifying. Part of this lies in our tendency to use the language of tech as opposed to using clear, simple language that an ordinary human being would understand. To them, oftentimes, tech terms sound like obfuscation, that is trying to hide something, which makes them wary. Or it's confusing, which makes them feel dumb. Either way, you're setting yourself up for a skeptical user that is not going to engage. At this point, I want to talk about librarians. Librarians are awesome. I'm not just saying that because Heather is forcing me to say it. <laughs> they're pillars of our communities. And when they're not winning the internet by trolling leaders, even using their sardonic wit and knowledge, even when it's not actually the intended target, but it ends up being the perfect target, or when they're not going out of their way to make the world of books accessible to everyone in a fight against censorship, they're performing the job of IT staff and IT help desk for many in our community. So when this beautiful thing called Paskies is announced to the world, and we're all going gaga over it, and we've been talking about it here at this conference a lot, and you have articles you know, going on about how it's going to change the world, it was fascinating to see a discussion pop up among the librarian community. It started off by this question, hey, librarians, can you please read this article and let me know if the average patron using a public access computer would be able to make this work for them, even with your help? It became a long conversation that started off by, I don't think I understand uh, what would need to be done. Or oh, it might need Bluetooth. And maybe it's even more complicated than that. Obviously, things we don't want to hear and things that are actually we're trying to avoid getting to. Actually, this is one thing we're trying to solve with Paskey. It went deeper. It started talking about things about how this was classist. It, made, it makes assumptions about devices that patrons have. Devices that a patron who's coming to the library to use a public access computer may not have or may not want to use because maybe they're trying to get away from an abusive partner or something like that. It went into conversations about fr frustrations that they experienced before with apps or mobile device-based solutions like the COVID apps that they had, a lot of librarians had to deal with trying to figure out uh, how to make it work for uh, people in their community. And then the conversation went where we, as folks like in identity, never wanted to go, saying that this is likely setting up surveillance, compromising security, and violating privacy. I think we can all agree that that is actually the opposite intent of what we're trying to do with Paskey. But this was their takeaway. Now, I appreciate Bob Lord trying to jump in as a vocal advocate for FIDO and trying to uh, d uh, d um, sort of clear up some of the air. And it was a really open, honest uh, d discussion that he started. But again, he used the language of tech. But what I really appreci appreciated was Anil's response saying, hey, how about we make people like librarians stakeholders in these processes? They know what the end users are facing. And folks that have seen me talk at this conference know that I have, long, I have been saying for a really long time that the way we develop standards and identity ignores a crucial step, which is we do not bring UX research and real-world user testing into the process before we put these standards out into the world. And that is not working anymore. The discussion thread that I showed you also highlighted that to create a system that people can, are going to trust, you have to pay attention to inclusion and ethics. 
That means doing the hard work to eliminate any possibility of classism, sexism, ableism, racism, and ageism. It means understanding how your solutions impact the lives of people that are relying on these. Building solutions that are for all people is not easy. And in our fast-paced driven culture, where the Pareto principle rules, and we have this break, build fast and break things culture, it isn't acceptable for us, especially in identity, to build things that leave people behind and forgotten. Being inclusive generates some really hard lessons for us in identity. We've started to see CAPTCHA show up everywhere, from sign-up forms to login forms, as a way of combating bots. But we haven't, I haven't seen a lot of discussion about how this impacts people who are visually disabled or impaired, or other such uh, people who have constraints that prevent them from using these, and it locks them out of these systems. All this discussion about identity wallets and verifiable credentials is wonderful, but it also makes me wonder how these will work in markets where systems like M-Pesa, for all its issues, largely succeeded at achieving financial inclusion better than any other identity project because it eschewed some of these standards and models and met customers where they were, where they needed to be. We also need to ensure that the processes that we design, whether they be onboarding, account recovery, or myriad other processes that we do in identity, because identity isn't just about data, it's about processes, Stephen. Um, we need to figure out how these processes are inclusive by design. Don Norman says that processes are values translated into and codified as structure and bureaucratic habit. So when your processes are communicating your values, they become key elements in building trust. And if your processes are meant to show that they are inclusive, you can't have your processes being built by teams that are not diverse. You have to understand that processes oftentimes in organizations are distributed, disjoint, owned and managed by different teams in the organization that don't communicate with each other. And that disjoint experience oftentimes creates distrust in users because they often find unexpected outcomes that erodes their trust. So we have to build collaboration. We have to work across um, team. We have to have diverse teams. It also means introducing abusability testing as a core practice. Because understanding how your tech and implementation can be abused or weaponized against an individual is your moral obligation. So I highly encourage everybody to follow the work that Women and Identity is doing in building a identity code of conduct. They're doing some amazing research that shows the human impact of what we build, and it really is going to help all of us figure out how to apply some of these principles in the work that we're doing. Of course, you have to pay attention to the fundamentals. After all, you can't, nobody's going to trust a system that essentially doesn't work, right? So trust is dynamic. It is tentatively granted, and then it is contested over time. So employing the scaffolding will help you create pathways and frameworks to continuously reinforce trust with your stakeholders, with your customers, and your end users. Nowhere is this need more obvious than in the area of biometrics. Biometrics is a critical aspect of what we're trying to build in the identity world, whether it be passwordless, whether it be um, identity inclusion. Yet it suffers from a huge problem of trust. And why shouldn't it? It is, I don't think there's anything else in identity that suffers from more FUD, or more miscommunication, or more miseducation, where sales, tax, excuse me, sales tactics throw out arbitrary numbers that can't be backed by anything in the science of biometrics, where we don't pay attention to the processes that need to be built into the use of biometrics or the security practices that need to go into it, where we constantly conflate terms creating more confusion and uh, issues of um, mistrust, especially when we talk about things like racial bias and how the technology is used. And nowhere did we see this play out like when the IRS earlier this year announced that they were going to roll out face recognition as part of their digital uh, identity proofing process. There was a swift backlash, 
there were a lot of communication missteps in, in, in conjunction with that. And I don't think I've ever seen a program abandoned as fast as the IRS did. But this has long-standing consequences. There are now multiple legislations being proposed that directly impact how face recognition technology is going to get used, both at the state and federal levels, which fundamentally, again, are deriving their ideas, their pro proposals from the miscommunication and mistrust about biometrics and ignoring the basic facts. And whatever you feel about this saga, however you feel about whether the IRS should have done this or not done this, understand that we are setting ourselves up for a no-win situation. Because what is rolling back biometrics taking us back to? Proofing based on KBA that relies on massive data brokers that have their own significant data accuracy, privacy, and bias issues, and even worse remediation mechanisms for individuals, if any exist at all. So I ask all of you to look at how your work impacts the trust that a person places in their interaction with your products and services. Remember that trust is relational. It's hard. It is culturally normative. It is contractual, and it is earned. In identity, we talk a lot about trust frameworks and zero trust architectures, which are primarily looking at trust from a systems point of view and are largely focused on protecting the business. But what we really need to be talking about more is zero trust models from the end user's perspective, from the human perspective. The act of putting your trust in someone is making yourself vulnerable to them. Every time a person engages with your products and services, they are taking a leap of faith. It is our job to reward that faith by earning their trust through trustworthy design. Thank you. I'm going to be uh, putting uh, on Twitter a lot of the notes and the links that I um, shared in this deck. And I'd love to have a conversation there with you or in the ID Pro Slack channel. Uh, so once again, thank you for your time.